This episode is about a serious topic, and I'm going to begin with an acknowledgement to the current custodians of the land. This is not intended to insult or offend anyone, but help stimulate empathy in a thoughtful discussion of an important topic. Let us pay homage to the great Captain James Cook, Governor Arthur Phillip, and the pioneers whose love and sacrifice for their posterity made it possible for me to have the freedom to share my views today. With all her faults, we love her still. Britannia, rule the waves. How did you feel when you heard my acknowledgement just now? Did you feel joy and pride? Did you laugh out loud with amusement? Did you feel fear? Did you worry that maybe I shouldn't have said those things? Did you feel angry that I said those things? Hold on to those feelings, because your feelings are important to you. Feelings are your first impression, your gut reaction to something. They aren't deep or well-informed, at least not at first, but through them you can reach a deep and well-informed place if you accept them and keep an open mind. About 20 years ago, I was at a public lecture and someone did the most extraordinary thing. Well, at the time, it was the most extraordinary thing to me. Um, they started their speech with something that was... Uh, the speech, <laughs> the speech was about communism, funnily enough, um, with an acknowledgement of the traditional owners of the land. When I heard this statement of indigenous acknowledgement, I felt very uncomfortable. I didn't understand why I felt that way at the time, but there was something about this statement that scared me uh, and that filled me with a sense of genuine dread. I didn't hold on to this feeling at the time because the talk started and I was far more interested in the talk than with the few words uttered at the start that seemed completely out of place. But over the years, I would hear these words again and again, and at different places, at my local comedy festival before performance, and also certain subjects and events at my university, and even at the beginning of podcasts. But more recently, I heard it before the beginning of a, of a public musical event, and each and every time I heard these words, and they tend to use the same words each time, and I, which made me think, uh, small modifications, and every time I've heard them, I felt very uneasy, I feeling that feeling of fear and dread, as though I was listening to something sinister. I couldn't articulate why, because I hadn't spent much time thinking about it, or why I feel this way, so I decided that I should really get to the bottom of this. Why do only some people give these speeches, and what is their purpose? What is their, I know their stated purpose, but what's their true purpose? As it turns out, these speeches started to be read out at the same time, without any precedent, in Australia, Canada, and the United States by people from the political left, particularly the socialist communist left. And I immediately found myself thinking, is this another case of Marxist astroturfing? Astroturfing is a term used in marketing where a company will pay for fake reviews and fake comments to be spread across all their websites and pages uh, over the internet to create the impression there is a grassroots popular support for something. Grass is natural, astroturf is fake, hence astroturfing refers to fake popularity. Astroturfing will often extend to fake news stories, fake interviews, fake polls, pretending to be educational when they are merely elaborately paid advertisements. The reason why companies pay for these fake popularity stunts is that human beings are conformists. We naturally want to follow what the crowd is doing. So when we see a lot of people um, go, giving lots of glowing reviews and comments about a new product, many people think lots of people are trying this, it must be safe, it must be the new popular thing, I'm going to give it a try. This is very manipulative. It is very dishonest. It isn't just being done by evil globalist corporations, it is a tried and true tactic of the communists. In fact, communists are infamous for going beyond just fake reviews and fake commentators. They'll actually produce propaganda movies, fake photographs, like they'll actually erase people from photographs, and they'll rewrite history books to align them with the ideology of the party. Like, in fact, apparently what they would do is they'd go into public libraries and they would actually um, destroy um, articles from the newspaper archive or magazine archive so people couldn't go back to verify what somebody else had said in the past. Um, it is really the, the whole, like 1984, George Orwell's 1984 with a memory hole, that was actually based on what the Soviet Union actually did. This is how communists operate. They do believe that if you can control the past, you can control the future. 
So this kind of thing is nothing new to them. So when I looked into this movement for putting in place statements of acknowledgement for the traditional indigenous owners of the land, I was surprised to find many websites across Australia, Canada and America provide templates for would-be speech writers and MCs on what to say in the beginning of public speeches. These websites were generally high to um, reasonable quality and looked like someone had put some effort into them. Um, and yet they don't cite any references or provide any kind of philosophical argument for why these speeches would be a good thing and how they would actually help race relations, particularly if they're meant for white people to say to, to non-white people. And that's very peculiar. Like, who, who goes to that effort to set up such a thing? Um, and the, the whole thing of not arguing, not explaining why these acknowledgements are somehow helpful is, is very suspicious in itself because it's something that a salesman would do is say like my product is the best on the market there's better than anyone else uh, my rifles they just don't work as well and uh, it's just a simple confidence trick you just assert it very confidently what you want the other person to believe and you don't provide any proof and it sometimes works because the unwary buyer might go well how could someone so confidently lie to my face and say it look me in the eye and lie to me and they use this uh, in marketing sales to, to suck you in. And that's what these websites look like. They're saying, it's good. It's good. It's acknowledgement. Acknowledgement's good. You've got to buy it <laughs> um, without question. Um, but it does raise questions. And the questions it raises are, who sets up websites like these? Who pays for them? And why is this such a pressing cause for them to be devoting their time and energy and money into? What are the aims of pushing this political and psychological agenda? And I, psychological agenda is what it is. Now, when I talked to people about my feelings of discomfort on these speeches, I found a lot of other people felt like I did too. They didn't feel comfortable listening to these statements of acknowledgement. Occasionally, I would come across someone who would say, you feel uncomfortable because you're just a racist white person who isn't used to have, having your white privilege questioned. This, of course, is completely unjustified personal attack on someone that doesn't answer the question of why so many people feel like I do. Since this is an emotional problem, I don't want to talk in detail about the ethics and theories, the philosophy, so much as how it affects the listeners in these speeches and the lack of empathy from the people making these statements in public, because their stated goals for these speeches is to show support and respect for the indigenous peoples of Australia, Canada and America, yet these comments are anything but supportive and respectful uh, once you start to look at the emotional impacts they have on people. Rather, I hope by the end of this video, you appreciate these speeches are carefully contrived psychological instruments um, designed to create divisive and antagonistic relations between people of different uh, ethnicities. Um, anyway, I'm going to go through four arguments and um, let's get started, shall we? The first problem. It's taunting indigenous peoples. If an Englishman stood up in public and started a speech regarding acknowledging the traditional owners of Northern Ireland, he would be doing that to annoy the Irish. Such a comment is obviously smack talk, and no one in the room would miss the taunt in such a statement. Likewise, for the sake of argument, let's just call the European settlers conquerors. When a white European conqueror starts a public address by acknowledging the territory his tribe has allegedly seized violently from the indigenous peoples, he is rubbing their defeat in their face. It's a clear case of, <laughs> nice piece of land you had here, <laughs> all mine now. <laughs> That's kind of cruel. That's mocking and cruel, and you can see it now. Um, and you'd see it, obviously, between English and Irishmen. So it's baffling to me how a person who supposedly has empathy for other people, so much empathy that, that they want to pay their respects to the indigenous people, that they want to acknowledge them, that they would choose this particular way to do it because it's so inflammatory. It looks like they chose the worst possible way to show respect here. Now, perhaps that's only obvious to me because I'm of Irish Catholic descent and I'm well aware of the horrors of the plantation in Northern Ireland especially how obscene it would be if a certain group of people like to wear, say, bright orange jackets and decide to march to the neighbourhoods of the people they conquered. This is no different. It isn't thoughtful. It certainly isn't respectful. It isn't even decent. So I find myself thinking these statements are not showing any kind of respect. 
This is just shallow virtue signaling. This is a trick used by narcissists who want to appear virtuous or empathetic, when in actual fact they don't care at all about the conquered people or how they actually feel. They only care about how other people perceive them. Now again, I think the narrative of colonial conquest is vastly overstated as well, and that's part of this political astroturfing agenda too. The second argument is that the language used in these statements is carefully engineered to imply that the white population living in these countries somehow don't belong. They aren't legitimate landowners or custodians of the land. They aren't native. This is guilt tripping the European population of these countries and telling them that they don't belong in the country of their birth. Now I'm, I'm native Australian. I was born here. My parents were born here. So were my grandparents. My family have lived here for over 200 years. No one has the right to tell me that I don't belong here in the land of my birth or to tell me I should feel guilty for existing. Yet this is exactly what these statements are implying. If you're going to claim that my 200 years of ancestry here doesn't make me a native, then how many thousands of years are necessary? Because if all of humanity originated from Africa, then that doesn't that mean that Africans are entitled to return to their African homelands? Additionally, there is ample evidence that people from Europe travelled to North America and colonised it before the so-called indigenous Americans arrived there, and I'll put a link below to that. Therefore, wouldn't the European migration to the Americas be seen as just social justice? Now, of course it isn't, because that's just collectivist insanity. The idea that we the living are somehow responsible for everything our ancestors did in the past as I've said in a previous video, the Europeans who first arrived in Australia did so against their will. They were convicts. Um, they were put into chains and forced to come here. The blame lies with the British government uh, of the 1780s and not the white population of Australia who are just as much victims of tyranny as the Aboriginal people. This black versus white race baiting is generally pushed by communists and governments alike because it divides the population against itself, making it easier for dictators to take over. Pushing this agenda that all white people should feel a collective guilt for perceived past wrongs is bad for the mental health of white people. Any white person who adopts this view that their blood is somehow tainted with original racial sin will suffer an injury to their self-esteem. They will have a difficult time asserting their interests and the interests of their families and tribes because they'll feel unworthy to have their material and spiritual needs met. People with low self-esteem generally feel that they aren't interesting, that they're not valuable, that they're not worth listening to, or they can't make any meaningful contributions to the world. They tend to ignore threats and slights against themselves, believing it's somehow justice that they should stagnate or suffer setbacks. Lack of self-esteem affects people like this, white people in this case, because being very moral people, they want to attack and destroy everything they see as being bad or evil. When a person sees themselves as bad or evil, they instinctively want to harm themselves. This is a source of many self-harming and self-limiting beliefs. Low self-esteem leads to a self-effacing, suicidal, self-destructive mindset because it turns the conscience against the person. The third argument. This implied white guilt also affects the indigenous people too. It stokes resentments in the hearts of the indigenous peoples who previously saw the Europeans as just another nomadic tribe who moved in and settled in the same area that they did. There were some problems like the spread of smallpox and other diseases, um, but there are also many advantages like metalworking, um, medicine, engineering, agriculture, science and electricity. Today there are more indigenous people alive than there were ever before Europeans arrived. Furthermore, these indigenous people live three times longer than they used to, enjoy a far higher standard of living, and enjoy political freedoms their ancestors couldn't believe possible. Overall, from an objective point of view, colonialism was a good thing for these indigenous peoples. However, from a spiritual or psychological point of view, it is only a good thing if you count your blessings, and a bad thing if you dwell on your losses. This dwelling on one's losses is a form of entitlement mentality, the belief that everything should go your way and you can have whatever you want and everything from life. Anything short of utopia, therefore, is an insult to your dignity if you believe that you can't have any setbacks. 
Generally, most indigenous people don't dwell on the bad in the past, but focus positively on all the good things that Europeans brought with them, and are grateful that the Europeans exercised self-restraint and didn't genocide them like most conquerors in history are known to do. You might want to read up about the Mongol invasions, the Muslim invasion of India, um, or <laughs> read the Old Testament and find out what happened to the Canaanites. Um, and even today, we've got ongoing genocides in China of the Tibetans, the Mongolians, and the Uyghurs. Uh, it's still going on. Uh, it's certainly not something that, oh, just white people do. And this focusing on the positives is a healthy mindset it, that nurtures compassion, understanding, acceptance, and personal growth in people. However, for some indigenous people, hearing these land acknowledgement statements, it stokes the fires of resentment. It keeps reminding them, you lost this, you lost a great opportunity, you lost so much, it's all set back, oh, it's awful. Um, and it's all from the implication that their land was somehow taken from them wrongfully. These acknowledgements are making a claim that being the traditional owner of the land somehow grants a special legal privilege to indigenous peoples. Consider that when you buy a house and move into it, and maybe you live there for 20 years, you generally don't feel too happy when the previous owner of the house comes along and claims their right to live in your house because he was the traditional owner of the house 20 years ago. Despite what you were taught in school, most land in Australia and North America was purchased from the native population through trades and agreements. The land Melbourne was built on was famously negotiated for from the local indigenous tribe twice. <laughs> and they were paid compensation twice for the land. Now, imagine if someone bought your farm and, and then paid the agreed upon pro sale price twice over. And like <laughs> that that's pretty cool. And like, okay, they may go on to use that farmland and make a huge amount of money because they could use the land a lot more efficiently than you could, but do you still, do you actually feel bad about it? I mean, sure, like an Aboriginal person today might look back with hindsight over the thousands of years their people didn't do anything, like didn't cultivate the land, and regret that those people didn't see the true value in the land they had at the time. But that's all it is, it's hurt feelings about a past that can't be changed. and. Um, so if the only argument the indigenous people have is hurt feelings, and if white people can't use their hurt feelings as justification to break their agreements, why should indigenous people be given a special privilege to break any agreements that they don't like the results of? Um, does that, uh, doesn't that imply that their feelings are more important than white people's feelings? I always say that your feelings should be very important to you personally, but they're not important to anyone else. Sure, it's really nice if other people respect your feelings, but no one is entitled to such consideration from other people. It's, that consideration is a gift. In any case, it isn't healthy to focus on things you can't control, like the distant past, but focus on what you can do today to make your life better tomorrow. Also, was it a really bad deal for the Aborigines? Like, they didn't know how to grow or cultivate crops on a large scale, nor how to build houses or factories. By selling the land to Europeans, they enabled other people to make better use of the land than they could, and in turn improve their situation with houses, cheap food, and running water. Such trades are definitely a win for both sides. When one looks for the problem in everything, that isn't psychologically healthy. It leads to resentment, frustration, depression, and hatred. People who get so consumed with the negative things that have happened to them in the past lose the ability to grow and prosper. Instead, they're trapped in the past, a past they can't alter or change, and they start getting trapped into wishful thinking, and they lose the opportunity to affect the future in a positive way. Yeah, bad things have happened to them. Bad things have happened to everyone. Um, but health, the healthy thing to do is to learn from them and move on, and not dwell on them until you end up in a miserable early grave. The fourth argument. Such statements are fundamentally divisive and promote alienation and war. They promote the idea that the indigenous people were collectively wronged by European people, and that all European people owe them an eternal debt despite never personally doing anything wrong to any indigenous people. This collectivism is creepy, disgusting, and very destructive. Consider that I'm a mixture of Irish and um, English stock, and I know full well that the English massacred and genocided the Irish. If I buy into collectivism and the concept of original racial sin, I should be at war with myself, because I'm both victim and oppressor mixed in together. I should beat myself up and destroy myself because I'm half English. I mean, that would be the logic of collectivism. But don't get me wrong, I've, I've read all about the horrible things that the English did to the Irish, particularly during the plantation era, and the planned systematic expulsion and extermination of the Irish from Northern Ireland, 
and I feel disgusted and horrified by these events. But I don't buy into this idea that the English are somehow fundamentally evil people. I see clearly that the British government was a brutal totalitarian institution with few self-restraints on its depravity. Now, the government don't mind this Irish man versus English man mentality because while the English are hating the Irish and the Irish are hating the English, no one is paying proper attention to the crimes of the government. They get, off, they get let off the hook because everyone's fighting each other on the ground instead of looking at the real enemy that they have in common. So, I see the Irish and English peoples as both equally victims of government tyranny. That's where I put the blame squarely, on the people in power who are corrupted by that power and using it to commit crimes that if you or I attempted, we would be very severely punished for. The situation here in Australia is no different. As I said, the British Australians were brought here by force by the British government. They were as much victims as the indigenous people. This race baiting is convenient for the government because so long as we're fighting each other, we can't see our common enemy, the out of control government. The communists constantly stoke race hatred like this for another reason, because they need reliable soldiers and prison guards for their gulags. The goal is to create as much racial hatred in the country so that when they um, do take over, they can really recruit racial groups into an army of prison guards that can take over the country. Thus, this misdirection of hatred away from the government towards Europeans is a calculated strategy to bring about the total takeover and ruin of those nations. These acknowledgements of the traditional owners are just another example of a clever communist agitation propaganda program used to promote um, their ends. And I assure you, if the communists do succeed in taking over our countries, the indigenous peoples will not be better off than they currently are. And that's why I feel fear and dread whenever I hear these public indigenous acknowledgements. So if you feel bad from listening to an acknowledgement like this, don't assume that you're just a racist or a bad person. Be patient and think about it carefully. People who don't let you think or talk about issues like this without hurting or shaming you or threatening you are clearly manipulative and working against your interests. Don't let people tell you what you're allowed to feel or how you should view yourself. No one does anything out of the kindness of their heart. Like even me, I make these videos because I enjoy making them and having conversations with people about them. Also, occasionally I get a bit of business from them. There's nothing wrong with that, because I'm not trying to force anyone to do anything, and I'm not trying to manipulate people into torturing or hurting themselves. However, communists are very dangerous people. I'd go so far as to say that they're deranged because they sincerely believe that the means justify the ends every time. They don't care how many lies they have to tell. They don't care how many people they have to threaten or traumatize. They don't care how many genocides they have to commit or how much destruction they must wreck. The end goal of one world government dictatorship it is just totally worth it to them. That's, that's all they're concerned about. Be alert to anyone telling you that you are a bad person. This idea that you are somehow born with original racial sin, that's a really dangerous idea to, to buy into. Self-respect is healthy. Priding yourself is very healthy. And so is counting your blessings and giving thanks for them. And so that's it for today. Until next time, Prospera ad astra.